The following podcast is an Embassy Row production. Welcome to another episode of The Shaken and Stirred Show. I'm Nigel Barker in the Hamptons in New York, although uh, apparently it looks like I'm in a prison cell and I am actually wearing bright orange. So, it, you know, I try to tell Tom that orange is the new black, but he's not having it, people. Tom, how are you and where are you? Hi, nice. I'm in the Cotswolds, you know, hunkering down for the, for the, for the, for the fall is setting in. So um, summer seems to be over here, which is a pity, but... Um, We've never quite got going, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm later on. I'm, I'm ten o'clock, ten o'clock at night to you, or five o'clock in the afternoon. So five o'clock somewhere. I do love the the weather update we get from Tom every single time we speak to him on the phone. Basically, oh. this is what English people do. The very first thing they do when they say hello to anybody at any point is discuss the weather. I mean, it's actually like a it's like a na- national pastime. Well, that's because it's, um, you asked me how I was, so I could just sound quite cold and turn the heating on tonight for the first time. And, and, and I, was, I was tucked up in bed and I got myself out of bed to come and do the podcast. Oh. There we go. How's that? that? Out of bed. But by the way, people, if you're a follower of Shaken and Stirred Show, you'll know that he actually has done the podcast from his bed before. This oh, is actually, it's actually nearly, happened. Yeah. Nearly got what it tonight. What are you thinking, old boy? I am having this, this, the old standard champagne cocktail. Oh my god! Um, really yeah. mixing it up, aren't you now? Yeah, I'm going crazy. Well, there's nothing. There's nothing. Tro- I, don't, I don't think it's particularly tropical. It's a drink I have at Christmas, and it's and it's seems like we're heading that way quite fast at the moment. So, um, yeah, you know, champagne, bitters, brandy, and and, and, and a sugar lump, and very very good nightcap as well as um as well as a pick me up. I, I think well, I think Tom is is angling for a champagne sponsor for the Shaken and Stirred show. We'll have to get I, right on that. Um, I, I'm actually trying something a little different once again. You know, as I always try to. So one of us actually tries to do a little bit of homework. Hang on, I had ber- I had hang on, I had mixed berries the, the cocktail last night with with a prosecco um, with with fresh fruit in the garden. In it. So I can't be accused of always. You know, oh, resorting yeah, to. So float some mashed berries in your champagne and all of a sudden you've got a cocktail. All right, yeah. whatever. Um, this, my friend, is a swizzle. A swizzle. Have you heard of a swizzle stick? I have, but there must have got to be, basically, it looks to me like some berries floating around in a glass of trunk of clear, clear liquid. Yeah, well, it would do, wouldn't it? Because it's made with clear white rum and yeah. um, Dolon Blanc Vermouth lemon juice freshly squeezed and a bit of grenadine and um see there's a a name for it like the serpent swizzle or something but i've kind of got into this my my friend i'm staying in the hamptons right now my friend has a a swizzle stick and and i've seen it on his bar and i don't have one and i didn't actually know what it was and his is quite elaborate and i've got sticks to stir and all that kind of thing in my sort of um you know at my bar back home but this swizzle stick for those of you who don't know the authentic one is actually made of wood. Uh, it comes from the Caribbean originally. And it, it's sort of a piece of wood that's sort of cut in multiple ways at the very bottom and it splays out almost like a broomstick. And you stick it in your drink and you sort of swizzle it, you twist it really fast between your fingers and it sort of froths and mixes the, the drink up. Um, and very, very popular and common in the Caribbean. Um, I actually used one which he had, which is metal, which is completely different. And it, it kind of has this sort of wire bottom that sticks out in many different ways, fr- throws out. And I so mixed this up. So, hey, it's uh, a little different, a little, you know, Caribbean touch. And I thought, okay. you know, I'm feeling hot and summery. It's 85 degrees here, unlike your freezing weather. I'm wearing T-shirts still. And, um, yeah. you know, we have a hurricane about to hit us by all accounts. So, you know, we do. Oh, well, Cheers, thanks. my friend. Yes, Boom. yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Absolutely delicious as well, which, you know, I, I'm not a huge, I have not necessarily a huge fan of rum, which is a funny thing right? because it's, it's such a popular drink, but it's becoming more and more popular. It seems that rum is, is the new tequila, which considering rum's been around forever, seems almost impossible. But before we get to our fabulous guest, I've got a bit of booze news for you. Some interesting booze news. Now, you know, birthdays, who doesn't love a birthday? I'm, I'm, I've always fond of of, of celebrating my own birthday. I love a good birthday party. And, you know, I I grew up as as Tom did in the UK, in England. And when you turn 100, 
in England. It's a big deal. I don't know about, you know, everywhere else in the world, but growing up in England, when you turn 100, you get a letter from the Queen. That's right, an actual letter from the Queen. And, and I've, that's a sort of, a, one of those sort of statements, comments that you, you, I don't know about you, Tom, but I grew up with people mentioning it, talking about it. Oh, this person's reached 100, she got a letter from the Queen. You know, and it was always quite a thing. Well, in Switzerland, they do something different. When you turn 100, they give you alcohol. They send you wine. And in fact, there is one district, um, and they call them cantons in, in Switzerland. And the, the name of this is, place is called Freiburg, Freiburg. And uh, in Freiburg, when you turn 100, when you have centen centenarian status, um, they send you 100 bottles of wine. <laughs> One for every year of your life, which is kind of fantastic. Uh, you, now, apparently, you don't have to take the wine. You can opt to have a, which I can imagine no one opts to have, which is some sort of armchair. There is apparently an, either you get 100 bottles of wine or you get an armchair. And I can imagine all these old biddies going, oh, I fancy an armchair. I, I, you know, I wouldn't mind have, sitting back in my armchair, putting my legs up. Um, or they're like, I'll have 100 bottles of wine and I'm going to, you know, I basically they drink the 100 bottles of wine. They're probably not going to see the 101st year, is all I can imagine. Floor with your legs up. <laughs> you certainly would be. Um, but anyway, regardless of any of that, with 100 bottles of wine, you know that they don't have to buy any alcohol for their birthday party. So uh, there you go. Sweet little bit of booze news this week. And our guest today is a household name in the fashion industry known for creating elegant yet rebellious, sophisticated yet sexy designs for women and home. Please welcome the talented and brilliant and my friend, Nicole Miller. Nicole, how are you? I'm um, great. Great to see you. So lovely to see you. We just established that you were actually in New York City, not in Sag Harbor, where you sometimes reside in the summer. And it looks quite eclectic behind you. You've got a bunch of colors, lots of pictures, lots of stuff. You know, well, is this your office? Actually, we moved. I think you were at my previous office, which was on the 20th floor. I moved down to the third floor, which is great. I love it being, you know, closer to the, the street level. But anyway, I've got a brand new office, but I had so many pictures and picture frames and they're all piled up on top of each other because I had like less space than I did. I had two windowsills upstairs. And so anyway, it was, it was good to pare down because I had too many things. Well, it's wonderful to have you on. And, and I saw you pour yourself a glass of, I believe, rosé. Well, I haven't poured it yet, but I did open the bottle. Fantastic. <laughs> so tell us about this. What is this? This is your own label, no? Yeah. So um, I have a friend, a French friend, you know, I don't know if you knew, but I, I am half French. My mother yep. is French and she brought us up speaking French. So I've always had a lot of French friends. And one of them happened to be a, happened to be a wine distributor. And he's um, very connected to some vineyards in, in the Bordeaux region. So we were talking one night and he's like, oh, maybe we should create a rosé together. And I was like, of course, that sounds like a great idea. So after many tastings and, and whatever, we we came upon this, which is a combination of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot grapes. And I, it's not the only rosé in Bordeaux, but I think most people think of Provence or the North Fork or, you know, Sonoma, Napa, whatever. So, but this is Bordeaux, so I think it's quite distinctive. So, so it sounds absolutely delicious. And by the way, I'm a big fan of the, of the Bordeaux area, but you, is it sort of is it dry then is it does that have act sort of is it more of a classic yeah. dry it is dry it's not sweet at all but it is full body so it's um you know it has substance but it's very dry amazing what was the process like i mean what it's, it's you know obviously there's a lot of people in the say celebrity world getting into alcohol and wine and stuff like that but there aren't that many fashion designers so this is a sort of a slightly different twist on it i know i feel like i've got a head start here <laughs> But uh, I'm sure it's only a matter of time. But um, yeah, but anyway, um, I did have to taste a lot of wine. So it, it, it did require some time. But um, in the end, I was very happy with, with the product and everybody seems to like it. And it's, it sells all over the Hamptons. It's, um, you know, it's at Bilbo Cay and it's at Dopo La Spiaggia and it's at um, Cabaniola's and, um, and the, liquor store in Bridgehampton Commons. I think it's McNamara's. And uh, it's a lot of places. And you can order it on Wine Express. And I'm sure they'll ship it to you uh, wherever you are. Oh, fantastic. Well, cheers. Here, here you go. Cheers. A little 
Well, I, I better better pour some. Pour yourself yeah. a glass. I better pour myself some. Fabulous. There you go. Very big cheers to you. Well, congratulations. How how fun and exciting is that? Yeah, we're not, oh, not it's it's been people. great fun, and we've been doing some wine dinners and you know some influencer dinners. We had a uh, big luncheon in Montauk with some influencers and. We had one in New York at Hudson Clearwater, which was a lot of fun. So it's it's been fun promoting it, you know. And I you kind of look of... like a rosé. I mean, <laughs> if, if I if you were to be a drink, if I was to say Nicole Miller was to be a drink, you I would say you would be a rosé. Oh, there you yeah. go. Well, and and also, you know, it's funny. I I'm sort of um, not inhibited about promoting it, whereas like I'm a little more reticent to push like a dress on somebody and saying, oh, you have to like wear my dress. So I'm like more self-conscious about that but the wine i'm kind of like you have to try my rose <laughs> I, I absolutely I'm not shy the about amount it. of it well the amount of rose that's being drunk in the hamptons right now you mentioned all the places it's sold that in the hamptons it seems like rose is flowing like water out here it certainly isn't it seems to sell out everywhere i mean last summer we sold out and uh this summer it sold out wow well, well, there you go out in, i mean it's sold out in the all the stores and the and the restaurants yeah Get it while you can, Nicole Miller Rose Day. Very absolutely fabulous. Look, let's. You mentioned already your French background, and that's your your mother was is French, and how you were sort of brought up in the states, but you know, it, almost with this sort of a mother who wanted to be back in France, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, she never really was. She never switched her citizenship, and um, we all got dual passports, which is nice. So. Um, that's that's come in handy uh, several times like once when i forgot to get a visa for brazil <laughs> i had to go as a, I had to go as a french citizen but then i couldn't come back french they said oh you have no visa for the united states so then i had to come back on my american passport but you know it does come in handy at times but um yeah and it's been you know great help speaking speaking french too but she um she, she uh didn't ever love the united states i have to say and where do you, where do you fit on that? And, and, and does that affect your either love of France or love of America or or, or in any particular way? You know, I'm I'm very happy here, and I love going to Paris to visit. But um, I went to school there for a while, and after I went to school there, I didn't really want to live there. So I'm, I'm just I'm happy in New York. I love, where, I love, where I love you, New York. Where were you? Where were your family from in France? From Paris. Paris, yeah. From Paris, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Parisians have a sort of love-hate relationship with Londoners, um, as you probably already know, and they're, and they're not necessarily the kindest when it comes to Americans, I always find. Whenever. Well, you know, that's not exactly true because people, they have this abrasive quality and they very often talk to each other that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just, they have this sort of like argumentative style that they very often, if you listen to a conversation amongst them, they're yelling at each other. So then if they yell at at you, you think, oh, they're yelling at me because I'm an American, right? They kind of go like, when I when I was in France, I realized that that they just treat themselves that way too. So <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. I've actually never heard it that that take on it actually. And I know that a lot of people feel they do feel slightly upset by it. sort of Parisians, just their style, not anything else. I mean, France, everyone loves, and it, and the sort of southern you know, people from the south of France are a lot gentler, a little more and mellow, yeah, warmer and mellow, and all the rest of it. And um, you know, and I spent some time myself living in Paris, and uh, you know, and with my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and we had a great time. But I remember multiple times when she would do or say things, and my wife's from Alabama. And the, the Parisians would just roll their eyes and sort of mon dieu, like whatever it was, whether it was the way she wanted to eat her oysters or yeah. <laughs> whether the way she was, you know, talking too loud or something. Yeah, and they're not very sympathetic with accents either. But I don't know, I've just witnessed them, like they have this way of like they scold each other all the time. And so, and I, and I don't know, that's just how they talk to each other. So I, I don't know, I never took it personally after I realized that. So... Tell us, take us back a little bit. When did you, you know, you've been in fashion for years and, you know, you, I, you and I have worked together and I was thinking about it today. I was just trying to sort of go back in my mind when we first even worked together. And it's like oh, 20 years ago. I know. Like, we, did, we did a lot of those bridal catalogs together. We did. Right? We did. We did bridal catalogs. Oh, and regular. And some other various, sort of yeah, various collections that you did. And yeah. we worked on a few different things over the years. And it, and it's, it seems like sort of yesterday, but it was actually 20 odd years ago, which is extraordinary. It just seems mind boggling. Because you weren't married yet, but nope. 
but you were together, I remember. But and you have a couple of kids now, right? We've got a couple of kids, and, uh, and a lot of different things have happened since then. You know, we back then this is you know pre America's Next Top Model. This is pre any of that stuff. You and I just right, worked together right. as a fashion photographer and a designer, and just life and, and and meeting each other. And it's it's been such a fun ride for for me. To, to, to obviously that was an honor to work with you then, but that since then to sort of have gone to your shows, to have seen you in action backstage. Right, we've also, we've stayed in touch. Yeah. We have absolutely stayed in touch. It's been it's been quite a trip. So I, I was curious, if, you know, because we've never I've never really asked you this, but when did you first know that you wanted to be in fashion? When because it's quite a it's quite an unusual sort of career choice, really. And and for I, I, I have to know everybody's in fashion now. They are now. But you no, know, when I grew up, I mean, um, my mother always had the French fashion magazines coming to the house, you know, and we lived in Massachusetts. So there was nothing very fashionable about Massachusetts, but um, we, you know, I always got Marie Claire and, you know, so I don't like look for all those uh, magazines, um, which were great. Uh, anyway, so I was always like obsessed and, uh, you know, and I thought, oh gee, I'd love to model. But then when I stopped growing at five feet four, I gave up on that idea, so. <laughs> So it was. It was fashion. That, that was it. That was it. That's all. I was like, else. oh, I've got to, got to rethink my plan here. <laughs> but I always was obsessed with clothes, so I started making my own clothes in high school, and so I always made a lot of like fun stuff, and you know, I would buy patterns and change them, and uh, so I had all kinds of cool stuff. And it's an interesting trend. Transition. I mean, it's funny because you, you say you at high school you're making clothes and using pattern. I was doing the same stuff, same thing. So I it was pattern cutting, tailoring, fashion designing. Oh, you were? When oh. I was 16, 17 years oh, old, I used so to make impressive. my own stuff, my own clothes that I'd wear. My own. Even oh, that's I, so cool. Even learned how to weave the material to make the material to make the clothes. So I was sort of trying to do learn all this stuff. Of course, I didn't become a fashion designer, but I've always thought it was useful to have that knowledge about the industry, about what the designer goes through to some extent. I mean, although very, you know, a very small, limited sort of childlike idea of it, but it gave me a bit of a background before I got into photography. Yeah, I can imagine. But, you know, it's so funny. There was a, a story in the New York Times a few weeks ago, and it was about men that sew. And all of a sudden, it's going to be a big thing of like men sewing. And actually, one of my assistants that I hired, he was a model, and then he wanted to intern. and. And I said, well, why do you want to intern? He goes, well, I can sew and I can make stuff and whatever. So it's been here ever since. Well, I think about how many tailors are men, right? I mean, it's yeah, not. Yeah, old school. Yeah, yeah. But you never think of that. Right. No, it's funny. You don't think of it. It's one of those things, too, where you often think, with, you know, with men cooking or something. And you're like, well, how many chefs are men? I mean, there, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of these sort of job descriptions, which for some odd reason in the house have historically or traditionally been one part of the family doing it but actually right. in the workplace the other you know so right. it's, it's an unusual thing and i think sewing is one of those ones where you know I, my father i don't think ever picked up a needle and when i actually as a young man started to do this my father said to me i'm not sending you to an expensive private school for you to become a seamstress you know, and, and, it, and it, was, it was very derogatory about the whole thing and i actually said to him i remember conning him into it saying dad don't worry, I'm going to become a, I'm going to study medicine and I'm going to become a plastic surgeon and me learning to sew, I'm going to be, have the best ability to stitch <laughs> someone up. And he was like, oh, that's, that's brilliant. He, yeah, it was all of a sudden, that was the greatest idea around it. And nothing to do with, you know, um, you know, actually really what I wanted, which is a love of fashion. Because <laughs> I knew he'd be terrified, horrified and terrified if I, if I told him that. <laughs> I can just see you doing, stitching up those eyes. There you go. So, so, you know, so, okay, the industry, I mean, what, what time was this? Because I'm, I'm thinking like the industry's changed an enormous amount. I, I, at the beginning, I was saying how you and I worked together. Back then, when I was shooting for you, we were shooting film, right? So, you know, that just takes it back to, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, film, what's film? You know, what, what is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How have you seen the industry change since you started? I mean, that's a big question. There's a lot, a lot's been going on, but sort of, Give us well, a little bit of your Everything is digital. It's digital. But, you know, a lot of photographers have told me that they're not making like the big dollars that they used to make. Um, you know, they said they used to get these like, you know, big jobs and location trips and all that. And they said that just doesn't exist anymore. You know, everybody's budgets are like way down from what they used to be. Um, 
uh, you know, I, because, you know, this one friend of mine, he said he used to get these $100,000 jobs, 10 day jobs and going on a like trip somewhere and everything. And so that never happens anymore. Is that because of, is that because there's more competition or is that because it's kind of less less printed? No, print, print? I think it's I, I, there's more competition, but everybody seems to be able to, you know, command, you know, they, they want to pay what they want to pay. And and that's it. And I, I think it's just there's um, I don't know, somehow the photographers had more control. And now it seems like the, the people that are hiring the photographers have more control. And the influences as well, right? So it's it's often to do with who's in the picture, right? Because you know these days with marketing, whereas before traditionally a photographer would shoot for a magazine or a billboard, you know these photographs you know, now are getting more. You know the, the clients or the the people hiring are getting more bang for their buck through social media. So they're like, well, you know, why am I? I don't need to pay for a magazine ad, or so I'm paying for social right. media. Right. So therefore, I'll go directly to the influencer who right. is a sort of slash model slash photographer shoot themselves kind of gig. And it's a very different kind of vibe. And even if they're hiring a photographer, you know, that, it, that, it becomes less about that person and more about where the picture will end up. So, you know, it's, it's, it is a hard one. There are some, obviously a lot of great photographers out there who also have big social media followings. And so those guys, I think, command more money and have done better for themselves, but they've had to understand how to market themselves almost like a model or a celebrity themselves, which is unusual for a photographer who's normally behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, well, everything is marketing these days. You know, I mean, everything, like every, I mean, an artist has to market themselves. You know, everybody with the biggest personality seems to get ahead of the game. It's the squeaky wheel. I mean, you know, you're, you're someone who has always been just on that note. I mean, you're one of the most charming people I've ever met. You, you, you're so consistent. You're so friendly. You're always this sort of, you're, you've really appeared to me to be, haven't changed in 20, 30 years as far as I can see. And, and but well, we met when I was ten, right? <laughs> right. Well, clearly, uh, and 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 it's you know, but it's I feel that you know you are very calm. You seem to be very you know like you you don't ever seem to be overly uh, well over the top diva dramatic like some fashion designers can be. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is, I I try not to get rattled. And tomorrow, you know, we're not doing like live runway show. We're doing our our presentation tomorrow, and we're shooting our presentation, and. I mean, everybody else seems to like have these like panics about things. <laughs> I mean, like a lot of things didn't show up that we anticipated were going to show up and like shoes in certain sizes and I don't know, a, a lot of things sort of, <clears throat> but you know, you just end up have, you know, make, you make it work, you make it work. And, uh, you know, I don't tear my hair out over it because, you know, we just sort of fix the problem. I mean, one, one year, the shoes didn't show up at all. It was the craziest thing. Fortunately, it was winter, so you can kind of hide things under pants and that kind of thing. And But um, we were getting the shoes made in Italy. And I don't know what this assistant of mine did, what she communicated with them. But the day before the, the runway show, or two days before, this box shows up like this big, and there's three left shoes in it. And that's it. And they were just like, they were corrections of the prototypes. And they're like, oh, we didn't realize you needed the shoes. So I'm sure my assistant like messed up on that one. But what How'd we you did, make that work? That's well, really you know, good. We found some boots that we had never used. So we had like, like eight pairs of black boots we'd never used. And we went on some website and found some, um, oh, I know who they were. You remember Jean-Michel Cazabat? Yeah. We found some Jean-Michel Cazabat boots, which were black black with no, you know, buckles, nothing on it, plain black boots. And we got those for the balance. And we did the whole show with these like plain black boots and, and my pairs that I had left over. So it worked out, it worked out. And, you know, fall, you've got long pants, covers things up, you've got a long coat, it just sort of, it, it just ended up working fine. But Nicole, but just think, like, you could have made history. You could have sent models down the runway, hopping on one left foot. Uh, and, and, and people would have been like, it's genius. It's yeah, just... and, and a size six. <laughs> a size six left foot. 
Wow, that is, that is quite stuff. something for sure. You know, I've got a funny story myself about something like that. I, I Back in the day, I used to work as a model. This is a very long time ago, late 80s, early 90s, probably, for a, a company which I don't think even exists anymore, Italian company called Basile. Do you remember Basile? B -A -S 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, had a... Yeah, I think I had something from them. They had some women's too, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did men's and women's. And I had shot their campaign. I was the model in their campaign. And then they had asked me to run, walk the runway for them. And I'd had this fitting. And, and likewise, what you just said, that something, something got lost in the communication. And I went in for the actual show and nothing fit. And I mean, really poorly fit me. So like, as in, I couldn't put the jacket on at all. I couldn't put the shirt on at all. But I was the face of the campaign and I was the face of the, of the, the sort of pamphlet that was on the seats for everyone to look at. So he was determined to send me down the runway. And what he did was actually put, I had the pants on. He then got the jacket and the shirt and tied them around my waist and sent me down with a suit yeah. jacket and shirt, bare chested with the yeah. jacket and thing tied around my waist. And no. people were like, what is happening? You know, and I was, I just did one walk open and close. And that was, I was out of it and done. I bet you're going to say he cut it up the back and like. No, he probably, for wow. photographs that might have worked. But um, very, uh, not actually for the runway show. So it's funny guys, what, what designers will do to make it happen. Do you have stories like that? I mean, obviously, you know, you must have done a lot of unusual things to get things done over the years. But are there any things that stick out to you where you've had th those sorts of crises before? Well, we've had some broken heels on the runway. One girl really like the heel broke and she just kept, you know, walking on her toe and didn't miss a beat. So you didn't even notice when you saw the video. Wow. And yeah, like, like things like it's mostly shoe problems, but nobody's ever fallen. And I've been to a few shows where like the model has just fallen or lost her shoe or kicked her feet, you know, there's all those like, you know, European designers where you see the like designer in the high platforms <laughs> fall down on her knees in the middle of the runway. I don't remember the Vivian Westwood it. moments. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe it was her, but <laughs> anyway, we've all had our like disasters. I mean, I've had the music get stuck a couple of times and once the music got stuck, once there was a power failure, things like that. The music, that's an important part. That's an interesting part. Do you play a large role in picking the music yourself or do you just work with someone who did, does it for you? No, I mean, well, in the old days, we'd always go meet with a DJ and play all this kind of music and we'd, we'd pick out, and like sometimes on our own, like my staff and I would find music on our own too and mix it in and, and whatever. Um, but the last three seasons, because it's all been presentation, we just end up, it ends up being like one song, you know? So it's not like we're, you know, it's not like the whole runway thing and all those songs. And then a lot of times when they replay it, they have to put in like some fake music. I don't know, you know, because it writes and you have like all this great music <laughs> that on your runway show. And then you see them playing it again and it's got like elevator music on it. And you're like, what? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, they all, they the rights to the music for putting it on that Instagram. That's crazy, and social. right? But everybody seems to have it on their Instagram. Like Instagram has got a lot of music. So I, I, I don't know what, how that works out. Is it all back to normal this year? Are you doing your runway shows and all of that this year? Are you, are you, no, you're... it's presentation. We're doing presentation again. We're on... I mean, and we're only having like three editors come to the presentation and we're shooting it tomorrow at Spring Studios. Um, so, so no audience then, it's literally just you're yeah, shooting just your three editors coming and we're just shooting everything and then we're um, gonna edit everything on site and then um, wow. hopefully be, you know, have everything done by like Monday. Do you miss it? Do you miss the runway shows? I don't. I actually don't, you know, my, my staff does, they go, when are we going to go back to runway? I said, maybe February. And I said, you know, I don't have to alter the clothes, <laughs> which is one thing. Like the clothes have to be perfect for its runway. And if, if it's not runway, you can just sort of maybe just clip it in the back if it's a little big. So you really, we really spend like three days, sometimes it's like working till midnight, all, altering and tailing everything to be perfect when it's runway. And then we have like 36 models. So this, we've got six models. And, uh, you know, you know, we adjusted everything pretty much. I mean, hem-wise, 
you know, got all the lengths right. But if the strap was a little long, we'll just sort of probably clip it. Or if it's a little big in the waist, we clip it. It's amazing, really. It's one of those changes where it, it, it's sort of sad in from the romantic, nostalgic side sort of standpoint. But from a uh, economic and sort of practical side, the, the presentation with the video and all the rest of it is far more sensible. I mean, you can, you know, really edit it to show how you want how you and want it. You can light much, it. It's not. It's not much less money at all. It's really? Kind of, no, it's um. Interesting. I guess is that is that is that perhaps the way you're doing it? Because I've seen your presentations look quite dramatic. I mean, you've got like you know some backgrounds going on. We you saw the on... one where we recreated the Chateau Marmont. Right. So when we recreated recreated that in our showroom, and everybody it was so realistic. Everybody thought we were in LA but um the guy did a great job he did it in a triptych and he had like the hallways cut out of the Chateau Marmont and they, we filled it in with plants and had the the rugs that we had just lined up looked exactly like the Chateau Marmont I hated taking it down that was great and then last season we did spend much money because we shot in the showroom and we did everything with lighting so it was very reasonable but this year we're shooting in a studio because our showroom is really not big enough to shoot so we're shooting in a studio. So that's an extra expense. And, you know, we need it to hair and makeup and the models and, uh, you know, the backgrounds and stuff. It, it, this shoot got to be it kind of expensive. Up. It all added up, yeah. It's interesting because too, if you look at this sort of historically, the fashion industry and, and fashion shows, runway shows, fashion shows were more about a few select editors looking at a collection and buying, you know, from that moment. And it, it kind of got carried away. And if you look then to what happened in the 90s and the 2000s, where they became such a scene, and it was more about influences and sort of celebrities than it was about editors, you know, and, and, it, and it, now it's sort of reverted back again, almost. You've got your editors coming to, to look at your collection, your three that you've selected, which is rather, you know, really a, a hand-picked, clearly a hand-picked, you know, three. And then of course you, you release it for the public to look at. It, it, it's sort of almost going back in time, or wouldn't you say? You know, the influencer thing is, I don't know, it's its very curious to me because, um, you know, even though I, I think these girls are great and everything, I, it just never seems, you get you don't really seem to get the bang for your buck. You know, even like, you know, they post your outfit, could be an incredible outfit, great picture, great likes, it just doesn't really seem to, I don't know, move the needle that much. I mean, we always... You know, we put something on Beyonce and then, you know, you know, the website would go wild and you'd be selling a ton of stuff where everybody would want what Beyonce had on. And I, I never see that kind of movement from a, an influencer that I would with a celebrity. Like, you know, when Angelina Jolie had that dress on, I mean, we just sold hundreds of them. So is that, is that something you look for still? Are you still looking to, are you still well, dressing? Well, we, celebrities and stuff like we're that. So, we're sort of kind of refocusing on that because it seems like the past few years everybody was like influencer, influencer, and spending money on influencers, and you know, and you know you have to do that. But I think you, we really sort of neglected our you know celebrity outreach for a bit, and so I think we're going you know we're sort of revisiting that. What's the design process like for you? Well. Um, you know, I usually start with some, I don't know, obscure idea or something I saw. And, you know, from there I develop like a color story and then work with my um, designer here to do prints. So we come up with like a print concept and, and then we design some prints. And, th and then from then we sort of just, it's, it's a whole evolution. We just sort of just get this kind of vision and maybe get some pictures of who we feel our like our iconic person is, and um, it's just an evolution. It moves from one thing to the next, but you know it usually starts with like the germ of like one idea. Like I see a picture or an idea, or I see a girl, or I see a movie or a painting, and it's like one thing so it kind of sends me in a direction. And you know, every once in a while, there's a year where I didn't get excited about anything, <laughs> so I'm like. What am I going to do? Where am I going to do? And somehow we always pull it out of the hat somehow. Do you, ever see, do you ever see a person? I mean, is there ever, going back to the celebrity thing and dressing the celebrities, do you ever see somebody, you know, in, in the celebrity world or whether they're a film or music or whatever, 
And you said, do you ever get that thing of, oh, I really love to dress them and then actually go out to, to, to make something around them and, and get them as, as get, you know, get them as your, as the end, wearing the end product. Does it ever happen that way around? Um, you know, it's usually happened the other way around. And I remember, you know, Joss Stone, I love Joss Stone. And I just, I had this, I was like obsessed with her and I was like, oh my God, I really want to dress her. So one night I'm watching some music awards, video music awards. I don't remember which award show it was. And she has won. So she's up on stage and I'm like, oh my God, I would just love to dress Joss Stone. It's just my dream to dress Joss Stone. And then I look closer and closer and closer. She's wearing my dress. Oh, wow. And I had no idea. And we had sent it to LA or something, or maybe it was in New York, but the stylist had, had been looking for clothes and sent her them as a possibility. And that's what she picked, but we didn't know she had picked that. That's quite satisfying. So that was great. That's and then satisfying. she wore a bunch of my stuff that year. She wore some, so for like every big thing she did, she wore like my dresses that year. I was going to say those collaborations are often, and again, it, it, I know it depends on what, what happens, but I, I've heard of designers having to pay a lot of money for certain stars and celebrities to wear their outfits to these award shows. Well, and I think also, European companies do right. pay a lot. Like all those big couture houses pay everybody a lot. But um, I, I made a lot of custom stuff for Kelsey Ballerini. You know, she is she's sort of like a you know, successful country Western star. Mm-hmm. And I've made stuff for Cheryl Crow in the past. Um, so I guess a lot of musicians, but you know, I used to try and do like the Golden Globes and all the awards shows in LA. And I can't tell you, like you spend so much time doing sketches and you do sketches and whatever, and do sketches for this person and that person, that person, and then, and then, oh, she wants this dress and that dress. And so you, you turn your office upside down and your sewing room upside down and make everybody crazy. And you make these dresses and then like, Maybe one person wears it, maybe they don't, whatever. It's just, I prefer, like, these are the clothes we made. If you like them, wear them. If you don't like them, we could make it for you, like, in a different color, but I'm not, I'm less about making custom stuff because, you know, they very often ask 10 other people to make them custom stuff at the same time. So, here's the next, um, here's your, the, your next Joss Stone. Oh, I don't know, maybe Casey Musgraves. Right. Okay. It's pretty cute, right? Yeah. He has great style. That's interesting. So you already have them picked out. Do you? And what would? Well, be no, process? because I'm not always thinking that way. I mean, I don't know. It just, um, you know. But I, I, she dresses pretty cool. I think. I think she's really an interesting. Yeah, but you can, you can see you can see people who style you. I can think my clothes look great on them, and uh, like you did yeah. with the Josh Stone thing. So, so that's she's just an example of someone you'd love to dress. You know. If, yeah. If, and the chances are, you'll, next time you see an award ceremony again, you'll be... Oh, there, it's my dress. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. You mentioned it earlier, but you, you were sort of talking about, you know, keeping things within a certain look and brand for Nicole Miller. How do you do that? Because if you look at your your collections, and I, I was, you know, breezing through your website again today, uh, you know, just knowing that you were coming on and looking at your collections, and... They, you know, they, although completely modern and for their moment and for their time now, but they also reminded me of, of things that, that I shot from, you know, several years ago, years ago. And it's this consistency in brand, which so when someone sees one of your outfits, they know it's a Nicole Miller. What is the secret to that? What, how do you create that consistency? Well, I think sometimes that's, you know, you can be the victim of your own success because if you keep doing like what's successful and then that's all you're doing, then people get bored with it. So, and I feel like, I don't know, I try to change things up, but then a lot of times people want me to go back to like, oh, make this dress again, make this dress again. I'm like, do I really have to make this dress again? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have dresses that just don't stop selling. Right, the classics, the sort of your, your 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 classic dress that people just want that Nicole. That's what the Nicole Miller brand is built on, right? Well, not necessarily, but it's just that somehow that you know some things you just can't stop making because they all always keep wanting it. And I, you know, I kind of go like, "Oh, do we still have to keep making it?" <laughs> your 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 actual 
I guess logo is your autograph, right? It's your mm -hmm. signature. Yeah. What I mean, it's a very distinctive look and everything else. At what point did you so did you write it down and someone just thought, God, your your autograph is you do you have a great signature. Can, let's use that. What was that moment like where you know you picked it? Oh well, actually, you know, I did change it. Well, when we first opened the business, somebody just said, "Oh, write your name five times." So I wrote my name five times, and they said, "Pick your favorite." So I picked my favorite, and they said, "Oh, that's going to be our new label." So I was like, "Okay," and um, then I realized. The more I signed my name, I got more like thin and streamlined. And it just, I don't know, it somehow it just, I think, got more sophisticated. And so at one point I said, I want to change my label because, I mean, it's the same logo, but it just, before it was more up and down and now it's like more longer and thin. I, I wish I had an old one to show you, but the old one was kind of like that. And, but it's the same signature, the same M, the same L's, the same R's. Nicole, it's been a real pleasure having you on Shake and Stir. Before we let you go, I'd love to kind of jump in. We have something called Last Orders, which is a pretty easy, fast action set of questions uh, just to wrap us up. Um, I'm going to start with a, an easy one here. One fabric or material that you would never use and why? I guess, I mean, I don't like Polly Georgette. <laughs> Polly Georgette, what is that? It's just a polyester Georgette, but it's always like slimy. And I guess I mean Polly Chiffon. Polly chiffon is really dreadful. There you have it, people. Polly chiffon, dreadful, Tom. Do not wear a Polly chiffon um, shirt ever again. Your, your, what you're wearing looks a bit Polly chiffon, I've got to say. Doesn't it? It could be Polly chiffon right here. Yeah, no, no. Chiffon is see-through. Oh, see-through. Okay, I was like, God, it's not see-through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can have your bare, bare chest again, like the runway oh, show. I right? know. Exactly. We bring <laughs> that back. The emperor's clothing. Um, <laughs> If you had, if you could, if you had to identify a car that most similarly uh, that, that you would recognize as yourself, what car would you be, Nicole? A, a Jeep. A Jeep. Yeah. That was a quick answer. A Jeep. Why yeah, a Jeep? Actually, I like my stick shift Jeep. It's my favorite car. Wow. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Nicole Miller is a Jeep. People. Um, but I never would have thought that. What gets your goat? I know you thought I'd be a sports car, right? I did. I thought you'd be some kind of I don't know Jaguar or some kind of a no, French. No, no. I'm, I'm like the badass girl in the stick stick shift Jeep. There you go. I like it. What gets your goat? What floats your boat? Me? Hey? Yeah. Do you know what that is? What gets your goat? What do you hate and what do you love? Oh, it gets my goat. Oh, okay. Um, what gets my goat right now is cancel, cancel culture and negative people. I'm like, everybody is like, wants to see the worst in everybody. <laughs> yeah. True. Believes the worst. So that really I, annoys me. I think it's like, a, you know, bad statement of the times and what floats my boat. I don't know. Uh, Vacation, going to like new places. You know, I was supposed to go to Pakistan for a wedding this summer and I was so excited. I was going to like some exotic place I'd never been to and whoever gets to go there, this friend of mine was getting married. And like two days before I was leaving, we found out because our flight went through Dubai and no flights from Pakistan were allowed in Dubai. So my whole flight was, my whole trip was canceled. Yeah. <laughs> But I've been look, looking at the pictures on Instagram. It looked like a fun time. So I love traveling some exotic place. How's that? Some place I haven't been before. In the, in the movie of your life, who would you have play you? Well, I guess I have to go with Julianne Moore because she's got red hair. There you go. That's, that's easy enough. I can see that too. It's, a, it's not a stretch. You know, we don't look alike, but, you know, at least she's got red hair. There you go. Tom, you could play Nicole Miller. It's, the genetic it's gold mine. Right. <laughs> have you got red right. hair? You're, I do, yeah. Yeah, you can't yeah really very see. nice. Sort of blonde, but it's red. It was, it was red. It was your colour when I was when I was younger. It's getting a little faded now. Still, from the, as, I, as we say, from the genetic gold mine. So, <laughs> you know. And Carl. finally, shaken or stirred? Oh, go for shaken. There you go. Why not? A little go bit of shaken. shaken. Shaken, stirred, and sewed. Sewed up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. It's a real pleasure. That's my favorite food, Dawn. <laughs> I know, right? What is? What, I, I should probably find out. Listen, good luck with your fashion show. Good okay, luck. thank you so much. 
New York Fashion Week. Real pleasure to have you on once again. And, you know, do stay in touch and, and I hopefully I'll see you during Fashion Week. Yeah, great to see you. All the best. Cheers. Hey, bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken and Stirred. We will be back next week with a, another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. See ya. See ya.